It was great. Just great. You know, again, it's normally, for technical reasons, normally you would not have the band and the singers in the studio at the same time. Um, because you want to, again, if you're wanting to get this real polished, perfect sound, you would, you know, you wouldn't want the piano being played in the same room with the singers as we had. But we decided pretty early on that there were definitely going to be some uh, uh, some emotional advantages to having it all happening live. We felt that the performance would probably be a lot more real if uh, the singers were actually singing along with the band right while they were putting their tracks down. And I think it proved to be true. Um, now, in comparison, the We Are the World uh, recording was actually done in, in pieces. The drums were done, in fact, at an entirely different studio. And they brought in a tape that was virtually done, except for the, the um, chorus going down into a big studio where they could get the chorus and all the media in. And they did, um, uh, they did the chorus tracks really as an overdub. So to get you know, I think they might, it, it was a beautiful recording, of course, but I think they might have gotten even a little more energy out of it had the whole thing been going on live. Um, but they, you know, there must have been technical reasons for choosing to do it the way they did. But uh, it was a great feeling. I mean, just an amazing feeling. I mean, the power of 20 vocalists is, is quite extraordinary. Um, and it's and especially in this case because these aren't 20 singers that are used to, you know, singing in a group. It wouldn't be like bringing in a, a chorus or a choir from a local church that's used to singing together. Th these were 20 um, individual vocalists, you know, who are are notable in their in their own right as individual singers, and to put them all together. Um, we didn't really have time to, you know, work out elaborate harmony arrangements or anything. We just sort of said, well, those who can grab a harmony on the fly, um, go for it. You know, just do it. Let's see what happens. So um, it really worked out nicely. I mean, we ended up with, I think, just the right number of people who were sort of doing scat in the background <laughs> and so forth, you know. I mean, there's so many things that are out of your control. You really don't. You don't know what's going to happen until you've done it, you know. And then, of course, you can't do it five times. You have to get it on the first or the second take. I think the one we used was actually the second, and the energy tends to build to the second or third take, and then, and then it's a diminishing situation after that. So you have to have your technical stuff together pretty early, and then you, uh, then you can, you know. Uh, hopefully uh, get what you want on tape at that point. Okay, and one, one thing that I think to understand, what we're trying to do here is deal with, with feelings and ideas. This is not supposed to be glittery, and it's not supposed to be fancy. It's pretty basic, down-home stuff which says something that's real. So it's not just to make it real and let people, but we're doing something I think reasonably historic. So let's do it good, and thanks very much for being here. I'll be isolated in there. And <laughs> You'll hear me and I'll hear you. <laughs> All right.
Uh, you want to take an audio feed off us? The malt box is right over there on the floor where he's plugging in right now. That'll, that's a feed right off the console. Let's take this, take the standard uh, mic connector. Mm -hmm. We'll get this thing so we have a sense of where the melody is. And then just get that, you know, Joanne, anybody else who wants to get those things to, to you know, oh, end chorus. This should be on, let's hear it loose and undisciplined. Let's hear it. Freedom, that's what it's about. I would like to be very much great for the sharp bears the many aspects of this thing which are very exciting, I think not the least of it is that we've assembled in run, one room uh, many of the best musicians in the state of Vermont. And that in itself, to me, is one of the important products of this whole project. Uh, the fellow who is, uh, Don, what is your official title? Are you the music director of sorts? Uh, Lawrence, yeah. Lawrence, <laughs> 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 the bubble machine broke, but we're, we're dealing with that now. Okay. Don, what's your feeling? Uh, when Todd initially came up to me, he stopped me on Pine Street one morning and, and uh, said, I want to talk to you about doing something later on this summer or whenever it was. And 
And um, he said, I want to do a record with Bernie. And I said, okay, just let me know when and we'll do it. And then later on, I got a tape from him of uh, Mark Greenberg put together a tape of the tunes that you asked for. And then uh, I sat and listened to him and listened to him in the car a bunch and kept listening to him. Got to know him. I mean, I knew most of them. There were a couple I wasn't real familiar with. And then uh, Mark Ransom, Jeff Salisbury, and I came in here and did a, um, a rough of uh, the tunes, trying to get the feels that we're going to use over the past two days. And then we waited for you to get freed up. This is hard work. <laughs> we were here at 1 o'clock in the morning. Here. Start two. You guys is that seven. You, you started at 2 o'clock in the afternoon? Yeah, you, you were here, you know, 1.32 in the afternoon. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, we got here, we got here at 2, we were here at 2 again today, too. We were here at 2 today and going. All right, let me ask everybody right. while you're here, while, while we have, you know, half the musicians in the state of Vermont assembled in one room. <laughs> let me ask you guys a question, and you tell me if you think I'm paranoid or not. I think that there is an extraordinary amount of, of self-censorship, in a sense, which goes on among serious writers and serious musicians, in the sense that it's not that you produce something that's rejected, but you don't even write it because you know it's not going to be done. All right. All right, who wants to talk to that? Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, Take the mic. <laughs> well, I'm sure other people... Okay, well, yeah, um, what happens is that if you want to stay viable as a commercial entity, you don't do stuff that you don't think will, you know, if, if it won't sell, you don't touch it. And therefore, uh, you do write what you think is going to work, what people will listen to. But then again, your audience sometimes, uh, they're, they're funny too. They don't necessarily want to hear what's right. They just want to hear what they want to hear. So you get caught in a bind. Am I, you know? am I right in thinking, one of the, I mean, what gets me excited about this project, what I love about music, and I have to tell you, I'm not a musician, believe me, as I'm sure you've heard, uh, is when music or poetry comes from people. It, it, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's good or bad. When you see kids, you know, we go into the schools and we see kids writing their feelings and their perception of the world, I think almost by definition that's good. And it seems to me that we have very, very little of that that goes on in the mass media today. Basically, it's canned. There's a, there's a mechanism, there's a style, there's an approach, and you, you, you fill in the blanks. They've already determined what's going to be in it. What astounds me is if you look at the world, just at the problem, some of the songs, with the content of the songs that we're dealing with today, the literal fact is that we've doubled the number of billionaires in America in the last year. Okay, you've got some people, May, one guy's wealth grew by $4 billion. One guy is now worth $8 billion. Okay, and you get people sleeping out all over the streets, all over America. Okay, how come musicians aren't writing about that? And I think the answer is not the fault with musicians. I think there are thousands of serious and good writers. But I think they said, why the hell should I write that? Where's it going to go anyhow? Is, 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 that, is that true? There are, but there is an underground. There's a lot of there's an underground, uh, yeah. yeah, there's an underground musicians, um, you know, in the folk world. There's folk festivals that just don't get media attention, but there there is an underground network, and it's uh, uh, just in the the recent travels that I've made, I've found that there are, there are people writing those songs, and but they're just not getting put out there, and uh, there's another yeah. interesting thing about that too in the. Res uh, you can hear message music, as it were. You can tune into that uh, show, uh, Top of the Pops, and they'll put on a group that has a great message song, and then they'll follow it with complete bubble gum. That's and the British show. Yeah, well, it's, Brit it's from uh, London and Los Angeles, and it kind of dulls the message. Mm -hmm. and it all, it, 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 right. One band's playing Pablum, and the other's playing this hard-hitting stuff, and then somebody's doing something. It, it, if you don't contain your message in a meaningful medium, as it were, in other words, if it isn't enclosed in a space that has meaning, then it loses its meaning. Let me ask a question. Give me a joke. I, I bet somebody ten bucks on this, so we'll, we'll see if, it, if I'm right or not. I think that the song The Banks of Marble, the way we record it, is not going to make the radio stations. I don't think commercial radio stations will put on a song which talks about the fact that some people are making millions off the exploitation of other people. I think Louie Mano will play it. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't bet on it. No. Nah. I, I, well, we'll see. I mean, it'll be interesting. Now, what makes it unique, obviously, is that, you know, we are known in the state of Vermont. Will they not? I mean, you have three television stations here tonight. Will they not play it? I'll be interested. 
And of the songs, we did a song, I don't think you heard it yet, but it came out really nice. It was uh, Where Have All the Flowers Gone, okay? I think that song will be allowed on the air because peace is, is okay, you're allowed to talk about peace. Okay, most people in one way or another are sympathetic to peace. But class struggle, you see, the fact that some people are exploiting other people, some people have billions, other people have nothing. Mm. It is such an absurd proposition that people are allowed to have billions when others are starving. There's no, no one can give a rational defense for that. And I bet you that song will not be uh, played we'll, very much. We'll play it on NPS. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. I'm not saying that some stations will not, but I don't think it will make the, uh, the general mass media, the commercial media. They don't want people thinking about these things, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's unbelievable the degree to which self-censorship you know, exists. You know, we talk about Russia and all that stuff. I mean, that's something I... I was telling you about this guy, Billy Bragg, from London, who was, you know, at, at, in Newport this summer. They wedged him between Bonnie Raitt, who's, you know, really popular, really, you know, who did a lot of stuff for the nuclear war and, you know, her movement stuff was kind of a homogenized political thing. She's got her own convictions and stuff. And they put him in between Bonnie Raitt and Judy Collins. And Judy Collins' thing was so, like, Vegas, it was really strange. You know, she was going, I'd like to talk about my newest American hero, Senator Daniel Inouye, and everybody's going like, what? <laughs> you know, it's like, what is this about? And like, it was very strange. She started singing like, God bless America, and it was really weird. But before that was Billy Bragg who came out with, you know, his combat boots on, black, you know, a t-shirt, a guitar with an amplifier cranked right up, singing about, you know, the, the workers in London and all the socialist things that were going on over there. It was just people like, in their in their lawn chairs, kind of squirming around and going, whoa, what's this about, you know? Whereas like Newport, the whole base of the Newport was, fo you know, folk music. I mean, that was where Dylan got, mm -hmm. you know, stuff thrown at him. And now it's like, it was like just a great moment. The police came up. It was really strange because all day long, people were able, able to come up to the fence right up front and kind of check everything out. When Billy Bragg came on, the Rhode Island State Police kind of just got real uptight and it was this real weird vibe and we just had to kind of cool that out. He got out there and was like, talking about Nicaragua, talking about uh, the, all the corporate stuff going on. It, w it was pretty amazing, and, and a lot of people were, you know, it was a real big moment there. You know, for it's folks. A funny, you know, obviously, you know, I'm in public life a lot, and I, I hear a lot of things, and, and there are certain things, which messages which are allowed to get out, and there are certain messages which are not. And the class issue, you can talk about the environment, you can talk about the desire for peace, you can talk about opposition to contra aid. But if you get on the air and you say, I'm sympathetic, not if you get on the air, but if you're a public official, I'm sympathetic to the Sandinista government. I think it was right they made their revolution. They're trying to do the right thing. No good. There are probably three people in the entire United States Congress who would hold that view. All right? You can be against contra aid. That's, mm -hmm. that's legitimate, okay? But you can't be pro-Sandinista. And you can't. But the real bottom line of all these things is the class issue. That's the one that they're very, very sensitive about. Wealth and power, who controls the world, who owns the world. There was an interesting article, uh, of course it doesn't make the mass meter either, it was uh, a study that, that came out that shows one half of one percent of the American population now owns 45 percent of the wealth. Ten percent own 83 percent of the wealth. Now you're not going to hear that talked about. What it means after all is said and done, a few got it all. They own every goddamn thing. The media is becoming tighter and tighter. Gannett owns now 91 daily newspapers. Okay, okay they own cable television, you know, these, these uh, and those issues you're basically not allowed to talk about. Now and then they'll put it on, but basically those are themes that they don't really want to hear about. I hope this, I hope, you know, having you in here and having people, everybody's been around, we all know it's great having everybody in one place. It's, I mean, I haven't seen a lot of these folks in a while, and we've all getting together on this great thing is really nice, and I hope, you know, I hope Todd kind of gets the idea that we can do a little more <laughs> of this kind of thing. <laughs> Todd, are you listening? But, you know, I mean, there's a lot of, there's, you can put any, like, three or four or five of these people together in one room and come up with a great, great piece of music. You know, it's, it just takes a while for that That's to right. sink in, and it, it, it'd be a great thing to have. You know, without trying to be, what's the word, maudlin about this, or over, overly sentimental, if I had, if out of this night comes the confidence on all of our parts, more in yours than in mine, that you can do serious things, that you can, you know, whatever it is, your own feelings, and you can fight to get it out, that we can, you know, your music can, can, can get out the way you want it to, rather than shaping your music to fit other people's desires, you know, to the degree that this does anything in, in, in bringing that about, I think that would be fantastic. And the fact, you know, uh, as Don mentioned, the fact we brought so many, of the, you know, Christ, I don't know that, uh, that we've ever had so many good Vermont musicians in one room at one time, and that in itself is fantastic. So, who knows, maybe, I don't know. We'll get your gig at Nectar.
Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Narrow down to just about that. You know, I mean, to, to work in the state, I mean, just I, I haven't played out, you know, like tried to support myself by playing out for a while now. But I know from Danny and Mark and Joanne and you know, Mike. I mean, everybody in this room is Rick. Everybody here is still, you know, knocking their head trying to get a gig around here. I mean, it's just it's really narrowed down. When the mud season comes, there's no work. When the after the foliage season, there's no work, you know? You gotta wait for the snow to fly, and then you're dealing with some real dangerous shit <laughs> on the highway, you know? I mean, you're real, you literally, that's right. Vectors is the only place where, that you can play original music in town. Is that right? I mean, uh, as a local music, I mean, you have your bigger acts come in, come through Hans the Point and everything, but Nectar's has kind of become the place where you can sing your own songs as opposed to the, uh, the radio, you know, the cover material. Right. It's hard to get, it's hard to get work. But outside of Burlington, it's like you, you know, what gigs are there? I mean, if you think, where, well, where you're are you playing, working? Then you know? you're playing the circuit, you know. What circuit? Uh, There's no circuit. There used to be a circuit, circuit ten years, years ago, man. There's no circuit anymore. Well, but you're still doing the, the, uh, the top 40, uh, um, you know, pop tunes. Yeah. And uh, you might be getting paid, well, paid more, but your uh, opportunity to play original music is still just as nil. Yeah. Well, remember that gig we did up at Smugglers that one time where they had, we had the band with, with Brian Curry. There's a band, and then this guy starts wheeling in these huge speakers, man. It was like, what are these things? Oh, this is the DJ. So in be after the band was now playing, this guy was up there spinning records. We're going, oh, this is really great. You know, that was really... <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the guy, his DJ thing was louder than the band. And it was, it was pretty it wild. It be interesting to see what happens when the classes start to break down. Mm -hmm. You know, when economics are something, mm -hmm. everything starts mm -hmm. to shuffle out to see what happens to people, if they're going to be open to what is truly happening, or it'll probably split right down the middle. There'll be th those who will be open, and there'll be those who just want to take off for a vacation, be it some oh, kind of musical to, avenue. You know? but all we're trying to do is to find a few people that don't sit in front of a TV set 28 hours a day. Yeah. Well, that's those, it. Are the, yeah. those are the very few people who are still listening to music. There are a lot of people who have been telling the truth in music. There's like YouTube, Bruce Coburn, very popular, very strong messages. But the people who need to hear those messages aren't hearing them. I mean, a lot of young people are getting the message, but they probably are attuned to it anyway. But the people sitting in front of the TVs watching pro football, drinking beer, are not hearing those messages. So that's the big problem. There's such a cultural gap between those who are in tune with uh, the power of the true music that's happening and those who aren't. So we have to try to bridge that gap somehow. Yeah. We have to set up a viable commercial network, somehow sort of radio network. That well, let me tell you something. One of the things that we in Burlington are spending a lot of time on is that thing. Okay? Uh -huh. Now at this point, you know, I'm not going to tell you that it competes with Channel 3, uh -huh. but I think we're getting a bigger viewing audience and the degree that we can produce good local stuff that people are going to watch locally and they're going to watch each other, you know? And we're having, I mean, going from, from local football games to local music. So we take that access business very seriously. We're going to put money into it and energy into it. Okay, I suppose we've got to get, we musicians have got to get back to work or something. <laughs> 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 There's something about this project that I, I think has to be said, and that's that when you, when you put out a project that has a purpose that's bigger than just promoting the personalities involved in it, when you put out something that has a message going out to the world um, about these issues that Bernie's concerned about, and he has you know, presented them in a way that I think has reached certainly reached all the people involved in the project who maybe hadn't, some of them perhaps hadn't connected their medium of, of music to some of these issues. In other words, you get caught up in playing nightclubs and stuff, you know, five days a week, and you start to lose sight of the big picture, you know, of the, the power that a person who is in the performing arts has, um, the potential power that they have to change the world that they don't really acknowledge a lot of the time. Uh, not that we all have to be, you know, running around uh, tr trying to 
improve things. But the, the point is that if you're going to be on stage and you're going to be singing about something, um, you might as well you know, make it something that's going to make the world a better place. And um, that's really kind of the fuel that has, has really accelerated the project. I mean, in my own mind, the project started as uh, somewhat of a whimsical idea. I didn't really plan that it was going to turn into a, um, you know, a political or social statement. Um, that was really Bernie's energy being infused into it. My, quite frankly, my original concept was quite a whimsical one that, you know, let's get this mayor who we all know is deadly serious about most things in this life, uh, who doesn't crack jokes very often in public places. Um, let's get him in the studio with a band and have him do, uh, well, I didn't know what his favorite music would be uh, at that point. I thought, you know, maybe he's into uh, Frank Sinatra or Bing Crosby or something, and let's have him, you know, let's have him do some crooning. I mean, it, it you know, that's the, that really was the level that it was on originally, <laughs> and it seemed, uh, for a while, uh, so ridiculous that I, I thought uh, we can't, you know, we can't uh, ask Bernie to do this. This is absurd. And and eventually we sort of tempered the idea and thought, well, maybe there's some music out of the '60s or something that he would be into that would, in some way, relate to his his thinking. And um, and of course, as soon as we uh, approached him with the idea, then a whole list of songs came right out, boom, 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 you know, and, uh, you know, the Pete Seeger material and the Woody Guthrie material, uh, these were, these were ideas that I would not have directly connected Bernie to right off, but in fact, once he mentioned them, it made perfect sense. So that's really, uh, it was that initial contact with Bernie that really gave the project some shape. And it was also at his suggestion that we brought in uh, so many Vermont artists um, I was thinking originally, you know, let's just put, you know, a five-piece band behind him. Uh, the idea of the big chorus was really something that Bernie inspired. Um, you know, he started thinking in terms of, well, let's make this into a Vermont musician's thing, you know, not just Bernie's album. Uh, obviously, Bernie's name being on it helps give it an identity and it helps, you know, it, it helps uh, make the thing marketable, of course. But it's also uh, a chance for all these artists who are somewhat disconnected from each other in a lot of ways, um, and even competing with each other for the little bit of work there is up here for a band. Uh, it's, it was an opportunity to bring all those people together and um, have them, you know, do something that that really had a a big big reason to to be, you know to be done. <laughs> against the mighty and the powerful, the human spirit, 
strong, resilient, alive, passed on like a torch from one person to another, from one generation to another, from one nation to another. The human spirit, may it never be extinguished.